Well, good morning, dear friends. Welcome to our Sum TV Secrets Unsealed Sabbath School and Worship Service. We're glad you decided to join us. It hardly seems possible that it's May 22nd, 2021. Time has flown by. Let's remember, as the pandemic winds down, to support our local churches with our tithes, our offerings, and also with the gifts and talents that God has given to us. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We trust that the service today will be a great blessing to your spiritual life. Our opening song this morning, God Will Take Care of You.
Good morning and welcome to our Sabbath School presentation here at SUM TV. Uh, we hope that you are going to receive a blessing from our lesson study today. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panel. Of course, to my left, without need of introduction, is Pastor Bohr. And to my right is Junie, Jeannie Wheaton. And uh, Jeannie uh, is working with Secrets Unsealed now in the Prison Ministries Department. And you've probably also seen her on the Living Well cooking demonstrations. And so we want to welcome Jeannie as a member of our panel today. And Thank you. we'd like to say we hope to see you much more, Jeannie. <laughs> Thank Amen. you. It's a blessing to be here. Thank you. All right. So uh, this morning we're going to get started. And uh, let's see, Pastor Bohr, if you'll offer prayer for us. Certainly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we study this very important lesson, on the relationship between the covenant and the law. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We want to have a covenant relationship with you. Yes. We want to keep your law because we love you mm. and because we know that it's best for us. Mm. And so we ask that as we review this lesson that your spirit will be with us, mm. inspire us and strengthen us to form that strong covenant relationship with Jesus. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, and we're going to ask Jeannie to read our memory text for us in Deuteronomy. Okay. Nine. Uh -huh. Okay, so the, the text is from Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay, so this week, uh, our study is going to center on uh, covenant law. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the relationship of the covenant with the law. And uh, so, uh, in, in this lesson, uh, I want to first take just a, uh, a look at the idea of election. Mm. Okay. And uh, so, we're... Uh, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. So, Pastor, if you'll, if you'll uh, grab that and, and read that for us, Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. Okay, that's in the context of our memory verse. Mm -hmm. It says there in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. Okay, so often when we think of election, we think about people who are being chosen because of their specialness. Uh, and often in conversation with uh, many of my friends uh, who are spiritual in their thinking, they will talk about Israel as an elect people, mm -hmm. as a special people, mm -hmm. and they will see Israel as someone chosen because of the specialness of their Jewishness, so mm -hmm. to speak. But here the scripture says something different than that. Mm -hmm. It gives us a list of why they were why they were chosen or why they weren't chosen, right. the reasons that they weren't. Right. Yeah. The, the, mm -hmm. How should I say that better? <laughs> <laughs> it gives a list of the reasons that God didn't look upon them as something special. Right. Maybe that's a better way to yes. put it. Uh -huh. And uh, and he enumerates that. Mm -hmm. um, he says you you weren't great in number. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't have uh, any, any special qualities about you. Um, so why does God elect them then? Well, I can say that thankfully God did not elect any of the other nations in Canaan. <laughs> <laughs> because we know they were beyond the point of no return. Mm -hmm. So God did see something different in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Israel. Yes. Even though they were the smallest, insignificant, mm -hmm. uh, unworthy, uh, I think God saw something in them that would lead to their election because they, in spite of all their ups and downs, they did preserve the truth. And even though they didn't receive the Messiah with open arms, uh, you know, they did keep their identity and there was a nucleus of individuals from 
the Jewish nation that formed the nucleus of the Christian church. But the issue is that God didn't choose them to become a special people just of themselves, you know, set apart um, or lifted up. He, he chose them for a purpose. And I think that's right. the bigger issue, mm -hmm. that it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, to choose them, to, to make them great uh, for themselves. So that, that's, I think, more important. Okay, than, so, so yeah. then let, let's, let's, let's flesh that out a little mm -hmm. more. And Jeannie, if you'll find Exodus mm -hmm. nineteen six, Sure. Uh, Pastor, if you'll look at uh, Isaiah 56, 7. Uh -huh. uh, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Okay, and Pastor in Isaiah 56, 7. Isaiah 56, 7 says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted at my altar. For my house shall be a house, shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we have two uh, ideas that, that may appear to be competing at one point, but now here they're, they're kind of brought together. And first is the function of this election of, of Israel, mm -hmm. there to be a kingdom of priests priest mm -hmm. and a holy nation. Mm -hmm. And how, how does that fit into this role of this, this covenant relationship? Well, they, they were to be an upright people that were supposed to be set apart in that they were morally upright. They were morally above uh, worldliness. So they were, they were a people that were following in the ways of God, living a righteous life so that they were, um, they were examples to the people of the world. They were, to be, um, they were to be an example of what God's ideal was. Okay. Yeah, so and this, this kind of uh, helps correct our thinking Often we think about Israel as being God's chosen people and everyone else being abased, <laughs> you know, being just, just out, of the, out of the parameters of salvation, so to speak. But that's, that's not what's going on uh, because God loves the world and everyone in it, and he always has. He created them, uh, and he loves them, and so he wants to do everything he can so that they can be brought back into relationship with him mm -hmm. uh, and be saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes so far in Isaiah 56 when he says them. Who is he speaking of when he says them I will bring? The rest of the nation. Uh, it, well, it clearly says uh, it will be a house of prayer for all mm -hmm. nations. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the them is everyone outside of this uh, of Israel right you know it's not just something that includes Israel right. the idea mm -hmm. is to encompass everyone mm -hmm. and then Hebrews 2 9 it goes on and talks about redemption uh, for everyone, everyone mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, the lesson has an interesting kind of spin where it says you know, this was the function of Israel to do this. Mm -hmm. They had this special function, mm -hmm. uh, not an exclusive position, but a special function. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe we have a special function, right. often though it becomes exclusive. Mm -hmm. And um, this kind of flies in the face of what God has intended mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we will portray to the people uh, on the outside, so mm -hmm. to speak, quote unquote, the goodness of God and invite them inside to participate. Well, I like the way that they put it here in the quarterly that um, we believe that we have something to say that nobody else is saying. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I became an Adventist some 42 years ago, um, I came into this truth, into this church because of that, because I wasn't finding these messages anywhere else in the, the Protestant world. And so it's, it's true, but that doesn't make me better. That just makes me blessed and makes me hopefully a blessing to others that I could share that with others so that they too can see that 
Um, there's much light um, that God wants us to understand about his love and his law, his covenant, um, and all the truths that we have as a church. So that's that was, it. for me, why I came into this church, um, because we do have a special truth, but that doesn't make us better. That just makes us more responsible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're accountable. More accountable. Yep. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that uh, Sabs Glesson points out that Israel was to be the vehicle. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's what the election was about. Was mm -hmm. making them the vehicle through which redemption could be made known to mm -hmm. the surrounding mm -hmm. nations, and that is our function as well today within the Adventist Church mm -hmm. to be the vehicle uh, to transmit this news uh, to those uh, in a sick and dying world. Right. Election with a purpose. Yeah, with the right. purpose. That, yes, this is the There's purpose. There's no such of thing as election simply for election's right. sake. You know, like the Calvinist view that God chooses a group to be saved and he chooses a group to be lost. And, you know, that's God's decree and that's the way it's going to be. No, God always chooses uh, for those he chooses to fulfill a certain function. And the scary part is that if uh, the function is not fulfilled, then God... Uh, revokes the election. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's an interesting uh, little nuance here in uh, the memory verse. Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 7, verse mm -hmm. 9, mm -hmm. uh, a covenant involves two individuals or two groups. Mm -hmm. There's always two. And there's always stipulations, as we see in the lesson. Uh, from the perspective of God, God chooses because he loves but God wants a response mm -hmm. from those that he's making the covenant with. Mm -hmm. And so the memory verse says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love, that's God's side, to a thousand generations, and now comes the response, of those who love him and keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. So I think the gist of the lesson is that God elects by his grace not because of the greatness of Israel, but God expects a response. Mm -hmm. And if the response isn't there, the covenant is broken, and God has to go to plan B, mm -hmm. like he did in the case of uh, the year 34, when the Hebrew theocracy mm -hmm. rejected the Messiah. Ultimately, then uh, Paul said, we turn to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It's true that in every covenant in Scripture, there is always an anticipated response. Mm -hmm. When God says to Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Mm -hmm. The idea is that, well, then Noah will follow through with the stipulations of the covenant. Mm -hmm. right. uh, when he makes a covenant with Abraham, uh, that Abraham will follow the stipulations of the covenant and mm -hmm. also with Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, th this, this is something that is continuous throughout uh, covenant language in, in scripture right. mm -hmm. all right uh, now let, let's let's look at uh, Monday's lesson here uh, the ties that bind and in Deuteronomy 4 13 it says and he declared unto you his covenant which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments and he wrote them on two tables of stone and here uh, I think we see the beginnings of a, a misinterpreted conundrum, mm. you know, uh, is it law or is it grace? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do this do, do these ideas of covenant law and grace come together? <laughs> how, how how is it that they are merged together? They mm -hmm. seem to be in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I look at the, if we could change the word law, I think it would be a lot easier for us to stomach it because the word law, you know, has these connotations, you know, getting a citation when you're driving or, you know, we see these, you know, these great 10 commandments that say do not. But, but when we look at what they really mean, you know, the first, the first four being, you know, love to God and the, the second uh, six being love to man, if we could call it the law of love, we would look at it a lot differently. But we, you know, I think it's just in mm -hmm. a society that we live, we don't want somebody to tell us, do not do this and do not do that. So we kind of shrink back from that. You know, the note there in Monday's section is really, really explicit and mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to read a portion of mm -hmm. it. When you think about what a covenant is, the concept of law as an integral part makes sense. If we understand the covenant as 
among other things, a relationship, mm -hmm. then some sort of rules and boundaries need to be drawn. Right. Yes. How long would a marriage or a friendship or a business partnership last if there were no boundaries or rules, either specifically expressed or tacitly understood? Mm -hmm. The husband decides to take a girlfriend uh, take a girlfriend or the friend decides to help himself to the other's wallet or one business partner without telling the other invites another person to join their venture, these acts would be a violation of rules, laws, and principles. How long would these relationships last under such lawless circumstances? That is why there have to be boundary, boundaries, lines drawn, and rules established. Only through these can the relationship be maintained. Mm -hmm. And usually we think of, of breaking the law as breaking a list of rules on right. tables of stone. Mm -hmm. But really, sin is, yes, breaking the law, which breaks relationships. Right. It causes separation mm -hmm. between God and man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you see this in the story of the prodigal son. When mm -hmm. he comes back, he doesn't say, Oh, I've broken the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother, and, uh, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. He says, I have sinned against heaven and against you, mm. and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Mm. Take the Sabbath commandment. What is the purpose of the Sabbath commandment? It's for us to take an entire day to enhance our relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. so, so we think of laws as being restrictive, mm. But what would the world be like if everybody kept the Ten Commandments? It would be the Garden of Eden. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, and so hence, you know, in the New Testament, it, it's regarded as the perfect law of liberty. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's where true freedom abounds. Right. And in relationship, if we're free to move in and to build a relationship, it has to be within some kind of confines. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, otherwise we're not really in relationship. Right, so you just look at marriage. What is the first thing you do when you get married? You have these vows. And um, mm -hmm. those vows, they used to mean something. I'm not sure how much they mean anymore. <laughs> but uh, those vows uh, before all the people and before God, um, they define you know, that I'm going to be with you, you know, till death do us part and for better, or for worse. These are, these are defining the boundaries of this relationship that, you know, forsaking all others. Um, and, and those are important. That's the beginning of, um, of a, a very important relationship that God has ordained. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about Tuesday's lesson. Mm. Uh, we have law within the covenant. Uh, and uh, let's uh, look at Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 10. Uh, 12 and 13. I've got that here if you want me to read it. Okay, that would and, be great. Sure. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Yeah, okay, so here again, we have... Uh, the, the merging of these ideas uh, that, that spring out of the idea of, of, of law. Uh, love, obey, serve, fear. Um, and why does God say these things uh, to, to, to Israel? Why, why is he spelling this out to them? Probably because they had been uh, in Egyptian captivity for, you know, 215 years, basically. And uh, they had uh, become affected somewhat by the religion of the Egyptians. And God constantly had to remind them about the covenant idea, the need to obey him because they loved him because of the graciousness that he manifested towards them. And uh, Tuesday's lessons brings out the fact that the Torah um, was was what was considered the law in the Bible, but it, it means um, the teaching or instruction. And mm -hmm. actually, it referred to a much broader. It didn't just refer to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. it, it referred to a much broader um, 
um, uh, writings, including the moral, civil, social, religious uh, teachings that God had given them. So it was quite encompassing of mm -hmm. all of life, the life of the, the Israelites, so that the, if they would live within the bounds of these, these teachings that God gave them, they would have a much more abundant life. They would be healthier. They would have healthier, happier families. They would have happier marriages. Um, they, would, they would, you know, rise above like Daniel and his friends when they um, were in Babylon. On, they would they would shine. They would show that they were better. They were healthier. They lived longer, and they were happier people because they lived within the confines of that which God had taught them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 so in, in looking at this, this law encompasses almost every. Well, if not it almost, does. almost right. it encompasses every aspect mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. The things that we do on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, in in our lives, and. Uh, God is causing them, when, when the scripture says, you know, I, I, you're going to be a peculiar people. You know, if, we're, if we're following the will of God, it's going to cause us to look different. Mm -hmm. that it should cause us <laughs> to look different mm -hmm. than those around us. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, then there's something wrong here. Right. Yeah, because when we're following God's way, then... It's antithetical to the ways of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it should cause us to stand out. And had Israel, uh, and the closer Israel got, uh, the closer they got in relationship, the more peculiar they looked mm -hmm. uh, to the surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. And the word peculiar, I believe, it means special, right? Yes. Special. Right. Yeah. So but, it, was, but it was a good thing. Spe <laughs> special treasures. Special, special treasures. In a different, I mean, mm -hmm. but different. Right. But different. obviously different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We have a biblical example of this. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the laws that God gave to Israel were health laws. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at Daniel chapter 1, and we've read this time after time after time. It says, of course, that they didn't partake of the king's meat or delicacies or the wine on his table. And then when the trial comes, uh, you know, the, to see what the result was, uh, we find um, in uh, verse, let's see, verse 15. And at the end of the 10 days, there 10 days, folks. Yeah. At mm -hmm. the end of the 10 days, their features appear better and fatter in flesh. In other words, they didn't look like a skeleton, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it says that uh, they were fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Uh, and then, of course, the steward keeps on giving them the same food. And then it says, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's just one biblical example of what happens when people obey the health laws. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not restrictive, you know, oh, but I like my pork. Yeah, God said don't eat pork, not because he's taking something good from us, right. but because he knows that it's going to make us sick. Mm -hmm. So all of his laws are good laws for mm -hmm. our health and for our happiness. Mm -hmm. And here in this example that you use, uh, for the one who is the leader of the eunuchs, it, it, it makes a differentiation yes. for him mm -hmm between those who are in this covenant relationship mm -hmm. and those who aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and right. as it should do in today's world. Right. In fact, the lesson brings out the fact that we as Seventh-day Adventists have been blessed with a tremendous, mm -hmm. tremendous amount of um, counsel on things like diet and things like uh, marriage and, and um, health and education and evangelism and all manner of life. And if we would open those beautiful books and read the writings and follow them, we ourselves are going to shine. We, well, you know um, from the blue zones that people live longer mm -hmm. if they follow, the Adventists live longer at Loma Linda because uh, they're following the plant-based diet which God has given us. So so God means well for his people. He, he gives us these things things not as um not as uh, hard laws for us to, to, harsh things for us to follow. But if we follow them, we, we're going to be blessed. We're going to be happier and our, li our lives are going to be more satisfied. Yeah. So in, in Deuteronomy uh, mm -hmm. uh, 10, verse 13, it says, And mm -hmm. to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I, which I commanded you today, for your, for your good. own good, right? Yeah. yeah, yes. So this this isn't something that is that that is meant to be restrictive, or mm -hmm. uh, compressing, mm -hmm. uh, or objectionable. 
It is something designed for the good yes. of mankind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God gave rules of worship, rules of music. Yes. He gave rules of health, gave rules of organization. Mm -hmm. Like the Seventh-day Adventist Church organization is very, very similar to the organization of Israel. Uh, you know, God gave to the Seventh-day Adventist Church basically all of the guidance and instruction that he gave ancient Israel, mm. but on steroids, mm. if we could say. Because <laughs> mm. Ellen White wrote over 100,000 pages of counsel on every sphere and dimension of life. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of these days are critical mm. of Ellen White and they don't want anything to do with her because when uh, somebody meddles with our lifestyle and we don't want to change, the result is to criticize the messenger <laughs> because we don't like the message. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is that the world has picked up that message and plant-based diet now, of course, has become very big and um, other people are taking on that message and, and leading the way where we should be leading the way. Yeah, you know, it's sad that many times you, we wait for the scientific world to, to uh, catch up mm. and then when they discover something like the plant based diet, we say, oh, we knew that all the time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we That's should have gone news. out with it before. Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, and, and here, you know, the idea is that uh, without these instructions, we're open to influence, as Israel was open to influence of the surrounding yes. nations. Yes. And the, the, the closer in relationship they were. This is, this is what, what I, came with, I, I came away with out of this week's lesson. Uh, when, when God tells them, you know, I, I bore you mm. on eagle's on wings. E eagle's wings. Mm. Yeah, I brought you out of, of Egypt. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, it's not that you were doing great mm. and that you were deserving of it, mm. but, but I loved you. Right. And I made a promise to, to your fathers. Mm -hmm. and, and so I brought you out. I bore you. And so now I want to establish this relationship with you. I want you to see what I've done for you mm -hmm. and what I can do for you mm -hmm. so that others will see what I did for you. And they will say, hey, I like that. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know, I want some of that too. Mm -hmm. I'll have what they have. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I'll, that's what I'll order. And, I, and that's part of what the Sabbath is all about. And next week we're going to study the Sabbath. So join <laughs> us next week. Uh, but uh, the Sabbath is, is must be a sign, of, you know, a remembrance of what God had done. If we, if we, every week we remember, we remember, we remember, we talk about God and his goodness and how he's brought us into a better place and um, how we how we worship God. But um, that that will show, you know, that will be, bring glory to the creator and um, happiness to us. Sure. <laughs> So in, in, in this context, then, Israel could not follow the ways of the surrounding nations mm -hmm. and remain in relationship and remain in covenant relationship mm -hmm. with God. Right. It, it, it was separate. And, and, right. and so often today, we, we kind of have one foot in and one foot out. You know, we want mm -hmm. to have this covenant relationship with God as long as mm -hmm. we can kind of do... We will worship Babylonian style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, 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 that, that, that came from one of your sermons that I, I enjoyed so much. We'll worship the God of heaven, mm -hmm. the creator, Babylonian style. Mm. <laughs> kind of yeah. like having your cake and eating it too, Yes, right? and, that's, and that's what we so often try to do. Mm -hmm. But it's because we haven't focused on the relationship and how good he's been to us mm. that causes us to be all in for him. Mm -hmm. You know, to you know, there is nothing in the world mm -hmm. that can compare with what he has for us. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a beautiful passage in the book of Zechariah mm -hmm. that points out what God's plan was for Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to read that. It's Zechariah 8, verse 20 to 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall yet come inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. And then there comes the response of the other nation, I myself will also go. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem mm. and pray before the Lord. Mm. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man mm. saying, let us go with you for we have heard mm. that God is with you. Yeah. You know, that, that encapsulates what God's <laughs> plan for election was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole nations would say, you know, your crops grow larger, your animals reproduce faster, uh, you know, you're healthy, none of the diseases have fallen upon you. What's the secret? Right. Oh, the secret is God has given us His laws and we love Him, we, we obey them. Oh, well, we're going to do the same thing. <laughs> that was the plan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Isn't there a verse uh, that he wanted them to be the head and not the tail? Yes. Yeah, we read that in last week's okay. Sabbath school okay. lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so so this this is God's plan for us. It is what he had planned in Eden for us to be happy, to be healthy, to be holy, mm -hmm. uh, so that we could be identified as mm -hmm. his people. Mm -hmm. And Amen. He, it, it, because of sin, mm. you know, he, he has to establish now this covenant relationship with us. So this, was, this was his relationship with us in the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, that we would love him and obey him and serve him, uh, and he would be our God and we would be his people. Mm -hmm. But from the fall, we, we have, our sins have separated us mm -hmm. from God, as the scripture says. Mm -hmm. They have torn this this covenant relationship mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I want to look at the idea in, in Wednesday's lessons of, about the stability of the law mm. you know because a lot of folks want to talk about the law being nailed to the cross and all mm. that. and 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 so they want to throw this whole concept of law out mm -hmm. uh, but as we have established law is is fundamental to relationship. There mm -hmm. have to be mm -hmm. some guidelines here. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, Malachi mm -hmm. 3, 6, mm -hmm. th this, is, this is one that I often reflect on. Mm -hmm. sure. Can you have that? Uh -huh. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. <laughs> so what's, what's, yeah. what's, 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 like what's, what's he really <laughs> saying here? <laughs> what's he saying? I and mean, we read that and we, we you know, but, but, we often don't reflect on it. What's what's he really saying here? Well, he's a God of mercy. Yes. I mean, and we know that. And then he's he's forever been a God of mercy. Yes. He's always the covenant has always been a covenant of grace from the beginning in Genesis. And uh, so he's saying, uh, you know, it is only by my mercies that you, because of your waywardness you haven't been consumed. Is, mm. is, is it? Okay. You want to add to that at all? Well, then the text says that God doesn't change. Yes. Uh, the history of Israel was uh, a okay. history yes. of ups and downs. Yeah, mm -hmm. our downs know, and downs. Um, <laughs> they got married to the Lord at Mount Sinai, as we mm. studied last week. And then, of course, they were unfaithful. And then they came back to the mm. Lord. And then mm. they were unfaithful again. And they came back to the Lord. But all through those, uh, those examples, God remained constant mm -hmm. because God doesn't change. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so God, you know, when they repented, he brought the, you know, he accepted them again into yes. covenant relationship until uh, there was no remedy when uh, sto Stephen was stoned. Mm. But even then, uh, God's true remnant, Israel, continued, yeah. and it started with the nucleus of Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I always see it as him saying, you know, unlike you, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> unlike you, yeah, I, I, I don't change. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm constant. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because of that mm -hmm. that you haven't been consumed. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because right. if I were like you, <laughs> you know, I, I might I might forego the whole mercy thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and I, you know, like you said to to, to Moses, you know, hey, let's do away with these people. <laughs> and Moses said, No, 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 Lord, you can't you can't do that. What will the Egyptians say? Of course, he's yeah. just he's just trying Moses. But of course, you know. But the idea is that God is constant, unlike us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unlike us. And, you know, the, the statement is made, and I, I, you know, it just reaffirms it for me. I'm so glad, Jeannie, that God is not like you. <laughs> and, and, and you probably should be glad that he's not like me. Absolutely. 
<laughs> My yeah. ways are not your ways. Exactly. Yeah, ways, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also in, in James mm -hmm. 1 17, mm -hmm. uh, there's a statement made there that I just want to reflect on in a minute. You know, Pastor, do you, do sure. you have that? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Mm. Okay, so mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of covenant mm -hmm. law and grace, how, how, do, how, do we, how do we see that? How does that work? He's a God we can trust. Yeah, I mean, he's a God we can trust. We can keep going back and we, you know, we can keep finding mercy. I love uh, Psalm 136 where it says, his mercies endure forever. Mm -hmm. And he says it like, I think 20, 26 <laughs> right, times. Right. His mercies endure forever. He's a God that we can count on, and uh, he, he is the same forever, and, uh, he, and that's, he's a God of love. It's, he's different than we are, but we can, so we can always, always find a refuge in him. Amen, amen. Yeah, well, go on, Pastor. I was going to ask um, if we can deal a little bit with the issue of law and grace, because in the Christian world today, mm -hmm. they place a dichotomy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. between yeah. law and grace. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we've studied throughout this entire lesson, there is no dichotomy mm -hmm. between law and grace. Yes. Uh, you know, if God, by His grace, saves us, mm -hmm. in gratitude, mm -hmm. we respond to God by obeying Him. Mm -hmm. Not as a legal matter, yeah. but as a relationship matter. It's kind of like a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, there's rules and stipulations to marriage. But I don't consider those to be restrictive. Mm -hmm. uh, I consider those to be just a guarantee that the relationship functions uh, smoothly and in peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's what, what struck me so much about the, the scripture that talks about how he bore them on eagle's wings. Because when they reflected on the idea of being enslaved in Egypt and having to suffer under the taskmaster, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, uh, having yeah. not the freedom to come and go. You know, I mean, the, the, the issue that Moses first presents to Pharaoh is let's, we want to go out and, and, and you know, to the wilderness to, to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And he says, no. So, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in an environment where you can't even worship mm -hmm. uh, the way you're taught to worship, mm -hmm. when God says, I brought you out of that, you know, so that you could have freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying that th this is, the, these, are, these are the rules of the relationship, mm -hmm. and you'll be happy if you do them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it, rarely, we, we don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our own lives, he brings us out of darkness into light. Mm -hmm. And from my own upbringing, in the little church down in Watts, California, you know, I, I saw families come into the church, you know, parents who struggled to read, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and, and speak, quote unquote, the king's English. But as their children grew up and attended the academies and went off to colleges, and, and I saw the parents, you know, become deacons and deaconesses and elders and could stand up in church and read the scriptures and mm -hmm. reason from the scriptures and, and, and could pray beautiful prayers. Uh, and, and their lives were so enriched mm -hmm. by, be, by, by accepting the truths and joining in the relationship uh, that God was offering, mm -hmm. you know, within the, within the Seventh-day Adventist church. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, it was, a, it was a, a real blessing. And I have friends who have left the church, and when we talk, I say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not ever leaving. You know, this is the best deal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the best deal I've ever run into. Right, yeah. right. You, you don't have anything. You know, I've, I've seen what can happen. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there was a, there was a uh, television personality, Tony Brown, I think was his name, uh, and uh, he once said to his audience, um, look, if, if, if uh, you want to do something good for your family, for children, you, you ought to become Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah, you know, because, hey, th this, this, is, this is an enriching mm -hmm. experience. And so within the confines of this relationship, it, there's enrichment. Mm -hmm. There's, mm -hmm. as the scripture says, joy 
forevermore. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, it, it, it's meant to be fulfilling. It's meant to be uh, what God had intended for uh, for us to be. I kind of wanted to read this little paragraph, if, if you would allow me. Please. Okay, from, from Wednesday's lesson, it says, The assurance, uh, this is from uh, Walter Beach, uh, Dimensions and mm -hmm. Salvation. He says, The assurance that God is reliable and dependable lies in the truth that He is the God of love, of, of law. His will and His law are one. God uh, says that right is right because it describes the best possible relationships. I really like that. Uh, therefore, God's law is never arbitrary or subject to whim or fancy. It is the most stable thing in the universe. Amen. I really love that. Uh, it's, it's, for the, it's, it's for the best of, of relationships, His law. And if we would follow that, we would have better uh, marital relationships. We would have better relationships with our children, with, with the society, and, you know, with God himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, I also want to hit on the text in Amos 3.3, 3, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that that's important. Uh, Jeannie, I know you have it, you know, scroll down there. Amos 3.3. 3. Yes. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Okay. So, in, in, in relationship, this, this speaks about relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, when we say walking together, that is assuming we're trying to accomplish something uh, in common. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're going the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not, it's, it's fundamental. Mm -hmm. We can't accomplish something if we're going in opposite directions. We have to pull together mm -hmm. To, to, to get to where we want to go. Amen. And so when, when God says, I want this relationship with you, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm God of the universe, mm -hmm. universe and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I hurt just looking at you and watching you struggle, I watching you almost drowning. I didn't know that you thought that about me. <laughs> <laughs> And he says, I, I don't want, I didn't. <laughs> I don't want you to struggle. I want you to enjoy the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. I want you to have this exceeding abundance mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. good in your life. Yeah. But it can only happen if we're on the same page. Right, right. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm going to give you the parameters, you know, because I'm God and I don't change. Right. So it's not bringing God into uh, right, our world. Right. <laughs> okay. It's not God, having God change to be like us. Right. Exactly. Okay. So it's for, it's always for us to become more like God Amen. and to have the image of God recreated in us. You know, through through His, through his transforming Spirit uh, that that works in our lives. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, uh, Romans thirteen is a chapter that uh, I've been studying a lot recently. Mm -hmm. um, verse verse five. Actually, the entire passage tells us that we're supposed to be subject to the governing authorities. Mm -hmm. And of course, Christians should do that. Um, but Christians have a higher reason for obeying the civil laws of the government than the common citizen. Uh, in verse 5 of Romans 13, uh, Paul says, Therefore, you must be subject, that is, to the legitimate laws of the government. Mm -hmm. Not only because of wrath, in other words, not only mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the government might punish you mm -hmm. uh, for breaking the, the civil laws, but also for conscience sake. Mm -hmm. And I like to use this example. Um, when you look at a, at a stoplight that is red mm -hmm. and you're coming to the intersection, um, why do you stop at this, at this traffic light? Well, the main reason why is because there's a law that says that you're supposed to stop, and if you don't stop, you get a ticket. <laughs> you fall under wrath. Right. But what Paul is saying is that when you come to the stoplight, and we never think this way, by the way, or very seldom, we should stop at the light because we say, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a ticket if I don't stop, but if I go through the intersection, somebody might get killed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So your conscience is telling you obey civil law because you love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so Paul goes on mm -hmm. at the end of the chapter. He says, you know, love, love is the fulfilling of the law. And he says that after quoting the last six commandments mm -hmm. that have to do with love for our neighbor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we obey law, mm -hmm. 
uh, not simply because we're afraid of, of falling under God's judgment. Mm -hmm. We obey law for conscience sake because we want to have a relationship with Him and we want to grow closer and closer to Him every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the scripture, mm -hmm. when the scribe came to Jesus and asked mm -hmm. him, you know, what, what, what's the greatest law? Jesus says to him, Love the Lord your God. Love, your, love the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. right. is, mm -hmm. You know, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Mm -hmm. And then the second is, is, is likened to it. Right. Love mm -hmm. your neighbor mm -hmm. as, as yourself. yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so he's basically saying that the law is. is is unified, mm -hmm. and we'll come. We'll come to that, you know, as 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 we get to the end of the lesson here. Mm -hmm. Amen. But the, the, we have to be agreed on the common uh, set of principles. Amen. In order for a relationship to move forward. And these principles, they uh, affect every aspect of our life. Every, yes. Like you say, stopping at the stoplight. I, I, I thought about this one verse in Colossians 3, verse 22. It says, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing mm. God. And whatever yeah. you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. So um, we, whatever we do, we should think about how is this reflecting on um, on God's character because people are looking at me and they're saying, okay, she said she's a Christian. How is she behaving? How is she treating others? Amen. Good. All right, we're going to look at a few texts uh, in, in, in Thursday's lesson now here. Uh, the, the if, uh, mm -hmm. name of the, you know, and we're going to look at, Pastor, if you'll do uh, Genesis 18, 19, Jeannie, Genesis mm -hmm. uh, 26, 4 and 5. I'll look at Exodus 19, 5. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get there. And then, uh, okay, if you'll read, Pastor. Speaking about Abraham, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And Jeannie. Okay. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Okay. Now in Exodus 19, five it says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for the earth is mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's this common theme that, mm -hmm. that runs mm -hmm. through these texts. Do you have the Leviticus text? Yeah, Pastor? I do. Okay, read that for us. Leviticus 26.3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them. Well, so what's, what's the common theme that runs through here? <laughs> Well, there are certain requirements in order for us to, we, we need to come into line with God's will in order for us to receive the blessing. For us, it, it describes it as like pr um, creating the environment uh, for us to be able to receive the, um, the promises that he's made. Is for us, we have to walk in the ways that he teaches us. And that, that way it opens it up an opportunity for us to bless, uh, for him to bless us. I like the li a little section here of Thursday's uh, mm -hmm. commentary. Mm -hmm. It says, when a person does accept it, that is the covenant, mm -hmm. obligations follow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not as a means mm -hmm. of earning the covenant blessing, but as an outward manifestation of having received the covenant blessings. Right. Okay. Good. Good. So it's Good. a matter of not putting the cart before the horse. Yes. Right. Yes. All right. And so there, there is this conditional... Uh, aspect mm -hmm. to covenant relationship. We're not forced to be mm -hmm. in the covenant. Mm -hmm. God offers us the opportunity mm -hmm. to be in the covenant. And he says, if you want to be in this covenant, these are the things that are expected. Right. Mm -hmm. Then these are the blessings that will, that will come. No, mm -hmm. None of the diseases yeah. from the Egyptians will come upon you. Uh, you know, you could just you could just mm -hmm. tick tick them off. Mm -hmm. You know, 
uh, the, the blessings, the covenant blessings. The, the ground will produce, your, your, your cattle will be healthy and multiply, and your children will be a blessing to you, on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, if you choose to be in the covenant relationship, mm-hmm. that is the then, if the if is followed. Yes. But we can always choose to not follow. Sure. Yeah. We have rejoice. Right. Right. And then there's a then to that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if we choose not to follow the covenant, the then are the cursings. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, then, you know, disease takes over Mm -hmm. because sin is, you know, is, is, is in the world. And so when we follow a way that is not the path of God, we have allegiance either to, you know, you can't serve two masters. Mm -hmm. You know, you can only get get one. So if we follow God, then the blessings will come. And if we step away from him, then we're following another master, Satan. And the curses that were covenant associated will will, will come to us. And And that's our choice. And we don't follow him because, like you say, we don't follow him because of the blessings. We follow him because what I do is I go to the cross and I see Jesus lifted up, you know, uh, on the cross. And I say, wow, Lord, uh, you know, what can I do? You know, I see how his, how how much he loves me. And I say, okay, what do you want me to, what, what is it that I could do for you? And then he says, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. So I say, oh, okay. You know, and then he says, that was John 14, 15 and John 14, 16, it says, and I'm going to give you a helper. And, and that's the spirit of truth that's going to live in you. And he's going to cause you to walk in my commandments. And, uh, I praise the Lord for, for that, that power that God gives us. Well, once again, friends, we, we, we've <laughs> almost exhausted our time, and uh, it's been rich studying with you and, and discussing <laughs> with you. I've really enjoyed uh, this time together, and uh, we'll have to do it again. Uh, and so, Pastor, would, would you like to just give us some, some closing thoughts uh, on this lesson that we studied? Well, I think the synthesis of the lesson is that God chooses us by His grace to fulfill a certain function, And if we respond to him in love and we say, yes, I formed this relationship with you, there's a covenant and everything good will come to our lives. Amen. The opposite is also true. Thank you for being with us. Please bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have been able to study this morning about your beautiful covenant of grace. We thank you that you are such a loving and kind God. And as we enter into our worship service this morning, we invite you once again into this service. We ask for your spirit to guide us and to bless us, Lord, as we seek to worship you in truth and in spirit. Um, We ask for everyone that is out there listening that they will receive a blessing from joining us this Sabbath morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, boys and girls. This is Auntie Louisa. Have you ever seen lava? Not like the hard black stuff that's cold, that's done lava, like active, orange, flowing, erupting lava. I have. When I was 11, my family moved to the big island of Hawaii. If you look on a map, you can see that it is the biggest of all the Hawaiian islands. It's bigger than all the islands combined, and it's the only one with an active volcano. Now, my dad loves going to national parks. And when you're in Hawaii and the volcano's erupting, you got to go see it, right? So, of course, we went to go see it. Um, the volcano itself is its called a shield volcano, so it's kind of low. And um, where it's mostly erupting is kind of just a big round crater. But this time was extra special because there was another little volcano going off on the other side and it was like actively erupting and it was close enough to the ocean that it was flowing into the sea. Well, my dad had heard that there was a, a, a trail you could take to watch the lava flow into the ocean. And an extra special thing to do was to go at night. 
So we went at night. We got friends from church and their parents. We got our flashlights ready. We got water bottles. We got hiking shoes because we're going to be walking over an old lava flow, an old black lava flow, black sky, black lava. And we would go out to go see the lava flow into the ocean. We were so excited. So we parked our cars. There's a huge row of cars on both sides of the road. We probably walked two miles to get to where the lava was actually, like the river of lava was flowing, but it was so cool. And over on this side, you could see, because it was dark, you could actually see where the volcano was erupting over here, orange just getting thrown into the air. And then as we got closer, we could see this orange glow in front of us. And then there it was, a literal slow moving river of lava. It was amazing. It felt, it was so hot. I got from, I got probably two feet from it and it was so hot. It felt like a, like a bonfire. It was so hot. Somebody had brought a stick and they stuck the stick in and poof, the end of the stick caught on fire and it's flaming. And somebody else over here threw in a coin and that coin, poof, you know, cause it's down there like sinking into the lava. The coin was flaming up in this blue green flame. It was fascinating. And then over here, as it's flowing downhill toward the ocean, we could see great billows of steam because the lava is so hot. And the ocean, while it's warm, it's still a lot cooler than the, than the, than the lava. And it created clouds and clouds of steam. And we could shine our flashlights up into the steam. It was just just wonderful, just amazing to see lava live and in person. God has given us such a wonderful world, a great world to explore. There's so many things to learn about. And I want to encourage you to go out and learn about the world God gave us. Explore, enjoy it. He created this world for our benefit, for it's our home. And we should see as much of it as we can and thank him for every moment that we get to be out in his wonderful world. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses four through eight. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tempest are wild. Still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who oh, from 
from his love conceived. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely hide forever. Under his wing, oh, what precious enjoyment! There will I hide till life's trials are o'er. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who oh, from his love can save his wings my soul shall abide safely abide forever safely Some TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for helpful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Some TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. Well, good morning and welcome to our Sum TV Worship Service Sermon. Today we're going to study a very important subject. However, before we do, we need to pray to ask for the Lord's blessing as we open the Holy Word. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege now of opening that book inspired by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you will teach us the lessons that will be useful in our daily walk with the Lord. And we thank you for the promise of your presence. We claim that promise in the precious and most holy name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus was a master at using metaphors from the physical world to teach great spiritual truth. And in our study today, we are going to study about the body metaphor as a symbol of Christ's church. Let's begin in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 verse 7, where we have a description of the creation of the physical body of man from which we will find many spiritual truths. It says there, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, or the spirit of life, and man became a living being. We need to underline several functions that are mentioned here in this verse. First of all, Jesus was the creator, according to John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 64 and verse 8 tells us, that Jesus worked as a potter when he created man. He took clay, which is wet dust, if you please, and with his own hands, like a potter, he formed the body of man. It was one body, but it had various parts 
and those parts each fulfilled a specific function. So notice, one body, various parts, but each part had a particular function to fulfill. Even though the body was perfect and it had all of its parts, it needed the spirit of life in order for that body to function. The capital of the body was the brain. The brain made all of the parts of the body function for the purpose with which they were created. Now all of these details that I've shared with you actually have a deep spiritual truth to teach. Now what is the origin of the metaphor that the body, the physical body, is symbolic of the spiritual church? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 25 and we'll start reading at verse 34. You know, you can look at the context at verse 31, but we're going to begin at verse 34. It is the great judgment day, and here Jesus is separated the sheep from the goats. Let's read beginning at verse 34. Then the king will say to those at the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And now notice carefully, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? So notice it's speaking about those who are gathered before Jesus, who is on his throne, but he's saying all of these things about Jesus. The nations either did or did not do these things to him. Notice verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So notice that what we do to others, to the body of Christ, we are actually doing to Christ. Another source of the metaphor might be Acts chapter 9 and verses 4 and 5. Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus to persecute the church. And as he journeyed, the Bible tells us that something unusual happened. Let's go to Acts chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. And by the way, this story is repeated in Acts 22, 7 and 8 in Acts 26, 14, and 15. This is how it reads. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, but Jesus says to him, in persecuting the church, you are persecuting me. The church is the body of Christ on earth. It is the flesh and blood whereby Jesus makes himself known to the world. The church is Christ's eyes, ears, hands, feet, lungs, and heart. The church is the only way in which Jesus can make himself known to the world in flesh and bones. The view that people have of the church is the view that they would have of Christ because the church is the body of Christ on earth through which Jesus manifests himself to the world. 
Now let's notice some lessons that we gather from the church as the body of Christ. First of all, Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus commands the functioning of the body. He is the capital. In other words, He is the driving force of the church. However, the church is the body of Christ. Now, the body is only one body. There are many different local churches, but the church as a whole is only one body. However, the one body has different organs and different systems with different functions to each system. So one body, different organs, each organ or system to fulfill a particular function. All the members of the body must interact harmoniously for the good of the entire body. Now listen carefully. All of the body parts cannot function unless the body has the spirit. If the body does not have, all, have the spirit, then it will not function in unity and all of the diverse parts will not fulfill their particular function. Now let's use the church of Corinth as an example because that's the uh, church that the Apostle Paul used the body metaphor, metaphor with most frequently. The church at Corinth was having a challenging situation in it. Some of the problems that existed in the church were the following. Everyone was speaking in tongues at the same time. Orgies were being celebrated. There was incest in the congregation. Members were suing one another right and left. There was fornication in the church, which was common. Idolatry was rampant. False apostles had infiltrated the congregations of Corinth. There was criticism over what people ate. And vain philosophies had taken the place of sound and healthy doctrine. But the main problem that existed in Corinth is that everyone was doing their own thing. There was strife, there was contention, infighting, and the spiritual spirit of rivalry. Let's read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's read verse 10 through verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 through chapter 10, chapter 1, excuse me, verse 10 through verse 13. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Then Paul asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So the Apostle Paul is saying the worst problem that existed in the churches of Corinth was division and strife among them. Everyone was doing their own thing, irrespective of what other th people in the church were doing. So then Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is going to use the body metaphor to illustrate how the church should function. And we're going to discover three specific lessons that the Apostle Paul sought to teach the churches of Corinth, and by extension, all churches in the world need to learn. The first lesson is unity. The metaphor of the body teaches unity. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and beginning with verse 4. 
1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. The Apostle Paul wrote, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills, that is, as the Spirit wills. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So did you notice the emphasis on one? Once again, the Apostle Paul says, For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So in other words, the first lesson that the Apostle Paul is sharing is that the body needs to be united. All of the different parts of the body have to be on the same page. Just suppose that one leg decided to walk forward and the other leg decided to walk backwards. You would get absolutely nowhere. Suppose that one eye wanted to turn to the right and the other eye wanted to turn to the left, each one wanting to do whatever it wished. Well, you'd have all sorts of confusion. Suppose that one lung would like to breathe in and the other lung would like to breathe out. You would have chaos and death. And in the same way, if everyone in the church is doing their own thing and going their own way, the church cannot function and eventually, if it persists, the church will die. The message of the body is that each member gives for the good of the one body. Tell me, which body part is most important? The heart, the lungs, the brain, the glands, or the bones? Which part of the body, which of those parts of the body is the most important? Well, you know the body could not function unless it had all of those functioning in harmony. The heart works hard to give blood to the entire body. The lungs work hard to give oxygen to the entire body. The brain works to give electricity to the entire body. The glands work to give hormones to the entire body. Each portion of the body gives for the good of the one body. The digestive, circulatory, respiratory, and nervous systems all work in unity for the good of the body. The organs do not exist to bring glory to themselves or to excel above the other organs, but they exist for the growth, prosperity, and well-being of the single one body. Can the heart glory, or the lungs glory, or the stomach glory, or the brain glory? What would these be if they were independent entities apart from the one body? The liver receives impurities, but does not complain. Yet the liver is as important as the heart. No arguing about who is best and most important. The heart receives impure blood on one side and sends out pure blood on the other. You see, folks, a nose needs a face. A tongue 
needs a mouth. Teeth need a jawbone. Hair needs a head. A hand needs an arm. A foot needs a leg. All these body parts are joined together and work harmoniously for the good of the single one body. Eyes and ears are great pieces of physiological engineering, but they need a head to hold them, a neck to turn them, and legs to carry them around. There is no such thing as a member of the church that does not participate by attendance, finances, missionary work for the good of the one body. You know, it's been said that 20% of the church members do 80% of the work, and 80% of the members of the church do 20% of the work. You know, what would it be like that if that happened with our body? Let's notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 to 16. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, on the idea of the unity of the body. I believe, folks, that this is the greatest challenge that is facing the Seventh-day Adventist church today and local churches today. Inward fights in the church, everyone working for their own glory and for their own recognition. Diverse doctrines, some in harmony with the Bible and some contrary to the Bible. Personal issues between church members where each person is pulling their own way. The church cannot function if this situation exists. Notice Ephesians 4 verse 11. This is speaking about Jesus through the Holy Spirit as He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now what is the purpose? Notice verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, now notice this, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So notice the whole body joined and knit together where everyone does its share for the growth of the body, for the good of the one body. Now let's use a biblical example of what happens when each part of the body goes its own way. Let's talk a little about some of the twelve apostles. Before the day of Pentecost, they were a band of disorganized, fighting, bitter men, each struggling for the top position. Let me just name a few of them with their agendas. There was Big Mouth Peter, who always seemed to speak before he was supposed to. I like to say that he would play, place his tongue in fourth gear before placing his brain in first gear. Then you have the ill-tempered sons of thunder, James and John, with violent tempers. You had Simon the Zealot, which was a, a political party that wanted to overthrow the Roman government. Then you have Doubting Thomas, the philosopher who doubted everything, who said, I won't believe it unless I can see it. Then there was Judas, the conniving politician, and Matthew, the agent of the IRS of that time. Who could ever take this group of misfits and join them, to, join them together in one body so that the body would function in perfect harmony? All of these disciples wanted the highest position and the greatest prestige and praise. Remember, 
when they were fighting over who could cast out a demon, when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, they were all trying to excel each other, so to speak. The church was merely a bunch of independent body parts strewn all over the place. But during the ten days before Pentecost, all the body parts came together, and the Bible tells us that they were all of one accord. Then the breath of life, the spirit of life, came into them and led them to work together for a common cause, and they became a powerful force for good, preaching with power, winning thousands of members for the church, and reaching the entire generation in one, the entire world in one generation. Before Pentecost, the apostles were an arm here, a leg there, a toe here, and a toe there. But during the ten days, they became a close knit and interconnected body, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and every body part began to function according to the reason that God chose it to do so. You know, we find an illustration of this in Ezekiel chapter 37, where you have the valley of the dry bones, and all of the body parts are strewn and separated. But then all of the body parts were told, come together, and then the Spirit enters uh, the, the body, and they stand up like a mighty army. That's an interesting illustration that teaches the lessons that we are looking at from the perspective of the Apostle Paul. It's no coincidence that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 as He was on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane for the unity of His disciples. Let's read John chapter 17, and we'll read verse 11, verse 20, verse 21, and verse 22 and 23. Here Jesus, the passion of Jesus was that he, uh, he, all of these disciples, each of these body parts, so to speak, could come together and function uh, according to the gift that God gave them for the unity of one body to preaching the gospel to the entire world. Verse 11 says, Jesus is speaking to His Father. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, that is the disciples, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Notice that the church being one has to do with whether the world believes that Jesus was sent by the Father. Then we find in verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Verse 23, I in them, and you in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me, loved them as you have loved me. So do you notice here the emphasis of Jesus in His prayer? He wanted all those disciples working independently from one another to be one, to be united, and to fulfill the function for which they were called. So the first lesson that the body metaphor teaches us is unity. The church should be all on the same page. It should be united. The second lesson that the body metaphor teaches us is diversity. Even though there is to be one body, there are many members with different functions for the common good of the one body. In other words, there is to be unity of the body with a diversity of gifts. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we will read verses 14 through 20. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 20, where we find this aspect that the body, even though it's one body, it has different parts that need to fulfill different functions. Let me ask you, is the church one body 
with members who have diverse gifts to fulfill different functions? Of course. You need a Sabbath school director. You need elders in the church. You need deacons in the church. You need a Dorcas leader in the church. You have individuals and you choose them to fulfill a function according to the gift that God has given them. And all of them, even though they are different gifts, they are to function and to work together. Notice 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So notice, here the emphasis is not upon the one aspect, but upon the many aspect. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. We should be satisfied with the fact that we, we should not be satisfied with the fact that we belong to the one body. We should not desire to just sit in the pews and warm the pews. God has called each member of the body to fulfill a specific function. We should not envy the gift that God has given someone else. We should use the gift that God has given us for the good of the entire body. You see, God gave each individual a gift and a function to fulfill in the church. And we must be active and we must use that gift for the good of the entire church. If each member does not fulfill its function in the body, then the body will not work the way that God intended. Notice Romans chapter 12 and verses 4 through 8. Romans chapter 12 verses 4 through 8 where we find the Apostle Paul emphasizing the same idea of unity in diversity. The Apostle Paul wrote, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who so shows mercy with cheerfulness. So here the Apostle Paul is actually being even more explicit about unity in diversity of gifts. Notice he says many members, one body, but the members have different functions within the one body. And he says, we must use the gifts that God has given us for the good of the body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul underlined also the importance of unity and diversity. He wrote to the Corinthians, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now let me ask you this. Which of the body members is the most important? The large ones like the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the brain. We say those are the important members of the body. But you know, some of the smallest members of the body are the most important, according to the Apostle Paul. Let me talk just for a few moments about the pituitary gland. It's an endocrine, endocrine gland about the size of a pea, weighing 0.5 grams. That's uh, 0.02 ounces. So it's a very, very small gland. Hormones are secreted from the pituitary gland and help control the following body processes. The pituitary gland regulates blood pressure. 
it, it regulates some aspects in, pre in pregnancy and childbirth, including stimulation of uterine contractions during childbirth. It regulates breast milk production. It regulates sex organ functions in both men and women. It also is related to the functioning of the thyroid gland, the conversion of food into, ener into energy, that's metabolism. It has an influence on water regulation in the body, temperature regulation. The pituitary gland also makes endorphins to relieve pain and to alter mood. Would you say that the pituitary gland is really important? Well, it's a little small organ, you know, it's only 0.5 grams, uh, so could it be as important as the lungs, as important as the heart, as important as the brain and the stomach? Of course. So the Apostle Paul says some of the smaller members are just as important or even more important sometimes than what we consider to be the most important members. Let me ask you, what is most important? The optic nerve, the pupil, the sclera, the lens, the retina, the cornea, the iris, or the orbital muscles in the eye. Which of those is most important? You say, well, Pastor Bohr, all are equally important. And you're right. They, the answer is that they all interact in full harmony for a common purpose. And that purpose is so that the eye can see. The third lesson that we learn from the body metaphor is interdependence or mutuality. There are many organs, one body, and the organs function for the common good as the different parts of the body interact together. Notice 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Here the Apostle Peter writes, as each one has received a gift, minister it to whom? Ah, interesting. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice, minister your gift one to another. We are members of one another. We are not isolated. No man or woman is an island. When one leg is broken, the other picks up the slack by doing double duty. The leg does not say to the other leg, you clumsy leg, tough luck, help yourself. You know, when I was uh, 16 years old, I had an accident and lost the vision in my left eye. You know, what would happen if we had only one eye? That would have been a big problem. Now, for a while there, when I played softball, you know, I would be waiting for the ball uh, to fall in my glove and it fell way behind me or it fell in front of me because it was necessary for the other eye to adapt its depth perception so that then I could actually continue playing softball and catch the ball as it came to me. So the other eye compensated for the eye for the vision that I lost in the other eye. Notice what the Apostle Paul had to say about this particular aspect. Romans chapter 12, we'll read verse 5 and then we'll read verses 10 through 16. Verse 5 says, So we, this is Paul speaking, be many are one body in Christ and individually members, notice of this, of one another. Not separate independent members of the other members, no. He says individually members of one another. And then he says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, be kindly affectionate, notice again, to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, 
Verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Did you see the mutuality here or the interdependence of one member with another? Let's notice Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This is a, a text that comes to my mind. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 and notice verses uh, 24 and 25. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is the mutuality or the interdependence of one part of the body with the other part. Notice Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 on this particular point. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, what should you do? Oh, you should rebuke him and kick him around. Absolutely not. That's what we usually do. You know, when somebody commits a grave sin in the church, you know, we're critical of that person. But the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, le yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That word restore that is used here, where Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, is the same word that is used in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21, where the disciples, after going out fishing at night, they actually mended their nets. So what it means is that when somebody is broken in the church, we do everything possible to mend them, not to destroy them. Notice what the Apostle Paul had to say about mutuality in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 26. The Apostle Paul wrote, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. Schism is division but that the members should have the same care, notice this, the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, listen to this, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the mem members are honored. So the Apostle Paul is sharing these three great lessons from the body metaphor. First of all, unity. Secondly, diversity of gifts and functions in the church. And finally, mutuality among all of the members so that they complement one another according to their gifts for the perfect functioning of the body of the church, the body of Christ. I want to conclude by reading a statement from the writings of Ellen White. You know, as we look at uh, many Christian churches today, there is great division. Now I want to make something clear. The Lord does not want the church to have a diversity of doctrines where one person believes one thing about a doctrine and the other person believes another thing. Jesus is not in favor of a diversity of beliefs. He is in favor of a diversity of gifts where everybody has the same beliefs in the church as members of the church. 
You see, Jesus believed in unity and diversity uh, in terms of men and women, uh, Greeks and Jews, in terms of white and black. He believed that everyone should be in unity. It doesn't make any difference what color you are, what nation you're, you're from. But Jesus did not believe uh, in unity, in diversity of doctrine and belief. I want to make that absolutely clear. So Ellen White wrote about what the Adventist church needs right now. This statement is found in volume 3 of Selected Messages 352 and when she refers to unity I want you to remember that she's not saying oh you know if you play worldly music in the church that's okay don't, don't be critical of that because uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of music you use in the church. It doesn't matter whether you ordain women as pastors or not. It doesn't really matter whether you believe that Jesus is coming soon. No, no, no. The, uh, the, that's not what is being said in this statement by Ellen White. She's speaking about unity and diversity and mutuality in the sense that we've noticed in Scripture today. This is the statement. Ellen White wrote, press together. In another statement, Ellen White wrote three times, press together, press together, press together. But in this one she says, press together is the command I hear from the captain of our salvation. Press together. Where there is unity, there is strength. All who are on the Lord's side will press together. Notice once again the third time, will press together. There is need of perfect unity and love among believers in the truth. And anything that leads to dissension is of the devil. Wow! Once again, all who are on the Lord's side will press together. There is need of perfect unity and love among believers in the truth. And anything that leads to dissension, that is division, is of the devil, because God is not a God of confusion, God is not a God of dissension. Then she ends the statement by writing this, The Lord designs that His people shall be one with Him, as the branches are one with the vine. Then they will be one with each other. Folks, if the Spirit is in the body, if the Holy Spirit is in the church body, truly, then each part of the body will fulfill its function, not in competition, but in unity. There will be an interdependence and mutuality among the different members of the church. This is what the Lord Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17, that all believers might be one in Jesus Christ, that the world may know that the Father sent Jesus Christ, and that the world will see the unity in the church and say, this is what we long for in a world of confusion, in the world of, uh, the world of fights, in the worlds of divisions. We want unity. We want a place where we can have peace and where we can make a difference. So folks, as we end today, I want to encourage each of those who have tuned in to take this message to heart. I know I need to take it to heart as well. And that we will plead with the Lord to give us His Spirit and to do our part in fulfilling the mission of the gospel by using the gift that God has given us to respect the gifts of others and to work in harmony with them. And when one member suffers, we suffer. When one, one member rejoices, we rejoice. In other words, we function as a unified body. May that be our experience in our local churches and in the Seventh-day Adventist church in general as well. May God bless you and keep you and give you a wonderful and prosperous and happy Sabbath day is my wish. Shalom. Our song, Jesus is all the world to me. Without Him, 
Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we live in a world of strife and division. But we thank you that in the midst of the strife and division, you have provided a city of refuge in your church where there's unity, peace, mutuality, and love. Father, we ask that as we have studied this very important subject today, that you will help us to be those who contribute to the good of the body. Keep us in unity in spite of our diversity and also help us to mutually care for one another. Thank you for having been with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name, the holy name that is above all name, the name of Jesus. Amen. 